And we're going to, as you're, as you're ready, um, and you grab your snacks and find a seat, uh, we're going to worship together, beginning with the song, O Come to the Altar. So in your own time, uh, please stand and join with us as we sing together. Are you hurting? Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come? Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling, O oh, come, O oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, what a savior. Girl. 
cross as you wait for the crown tell the world of the new love you found amen let's continue singing together this morning Oh God. Oh God, how could I stand if it wasn't for your mercy? Your heart reaching for mine, you have never stopped loving. Your kindness, your kindness called me home into your. Great Redeemer. Great Redeemer, lover of my soul. Firm foundation with me through it all. Firm foundation with me through it all. Oh God. didn't come for free. You paid the highest price to restore me for eternity. Your precious blood. Your precious blood has washed all my sin away. A debt of love I Sovereign hands that made the earth and heaven. Your sovereign hands that made the earth and heaven bore the scars that have healed my life. Your precious feet, your precious feet that walked upon the water led you humbly to be crucified.
going to have a moment of corporate reading. The words are going to be on the screen. Uh, fair warning, it is a kind of long psalm. Um, we're just going to sing, uh, read through Psalm 16, verses 1 through 11. Um, I just pray that these words, as I was reading through this psalm this week, actually just came up in my reading plan that I'm doing, um, and the words really struck me of how we can rest and our, our bodies can rest secure, our minds can rest secure in the Lord. And so as we reflect on the theme of Sabbath today, I just pray that these words that we say together will just remind us of how God is over and around and through all that we do and we can take refuge in him. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Wow. 
God, would that be our prayer this morning, that our souls would long after you, that we would find rest in you, the things that we chase after, seek rest in other than you, we pray that those would fall away, God, that you would be our strength, that we would remember that you're watching us even when we can't see you. God, if your eye is on the sparrow, then you're watching over us as well, and so I pray that that would be a comfort and be our refuge this morning. I pray over your servant Kenson as he delivers the message. I pray that your spirit would be working through him and through the rest of this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. At this time, I'd like to dismiss the kids to the loop. So go on and head back to the volunteers there in the back. And let's, while we're standing, take a moment to turn to your neighbor and introduce yourself. If you need something to chat about, what's your favorite indoor cold weather activity? I'm looking for ideas. <laughs> I'll be crowdsourcing ideas after the service. I want to hear the good things. All right. Well, if you don't know me, my name is Jen Alvarez, and I'm a member here at Park Community Church Bridgeport. I'm also a small group leader, um, 
and I know many of your faces, but if you're new here, we would love to get to know you as well. We have a new procedure for the new year. So on your seat, instead of the full postcards we used to have for connections cards, we now have this very eco-friendly QR code. Um, so if you are new here and you wanna get connected, maybe speak to somebody who's on the staff, like our head pastor or um, our elder, Paul Boy, or one of our deacons, uh, go ahead and scan this QR code. If you're old school and you still want to fill out a paper one, we do have those at the connect bar in the back, so you're welcome to do that as well. Um, as a church, we are um, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to all people until there's no place left. I have three announcements for you. The first one is that next Sunday, which is January 27th, yes, it's already the last Sunday of January, yes, um, we're getting closer to spring. We will have an all-church celebration at Moody Bible Institute, which is the school um, downtown, and we will not be here. And it's at the same time, 10 a.m., so if you come and there's no one here, it's because we're all at Moody with the rest of the park campuses. Um, this is our winter celebration. If you need more information about parking, you can just go to our website, the Park Community Church Bridgeport website. There is a parking garage right across the street, which you'll have um, access to. And then if you're a family, they have a separate family viewing space for the service. Um, and then if you have any other questions, you can ask Nicole too, who I'm sure has many more answers than I do. Um, the next announcement is that we're always looking for volunteers to help in different areas of our ministry. So right now we're looking for more connections volunteers. If you're not familiar with what that is, um, every week we completely clear out this space. And then on Sunday morning, we pop it back up again. So then after you guys leave, we have to tear it all back down. Um, that is not that crew, but that crew, the connections crew assists with that process. So like setting out the chairs, um, setting up the coffee and snack bar. So if you like coffee and you wanna keep that hot coffee flowing on a Sunday morning, we need hands to make it and hands to serve it. Um, so if you're interested, you can either talk to Brock in the back who leads connections, wave your hand, um, or you can stop at the connect bar um, but we'd love to have you join us. It's about a two hour commitment, one Sunday per month. And with that call, I actually volunteered myself and my daughter now. So any ages are really welcome. Um, now I wanna uh, introduce our head pastor, Kenson Lamb, who's gonna come up and talk about a new outreach program. Yeah. Oh, that's so sweet of you guys. All right. Uh, Kenson, uh, honored to be with you all this morning as the pastor of our church. Um, you know, my wife and I joined this church back in January of 2010. Uh, so it's been about 14 years. That's a long time. You know, one of the reasons why we committed our ministry to be in this church and have stayed as long as we have is because of the church's vision to reach the city with the gospel. You know, I remember meeting with the pastoral team during my interview and how all of them shared that they were committed to seeing a gospel preaching church in every neighborhood of Chicago. That God laid a vision for this church to do everything we can so that the spiritually lost can know the name of Jesus Christ. You know, I say all that because that is why we are here in Bridgeport. We are not here for your convenience. We're not here to save you some gas money. We're here for those who are not yet here. You know, as our elder Paul preached three weeks ago, we believe that God has called us to be here to bring shalom to our city, specifically here in Bridgeport, that the empty seats that I see in this room here today always reminds me that the mission is not yet done. You know, in a few moments, I'm going to invite up Grant and Julia, and what's been happening in their hearts for the last few months is that God has been calling them to take greater steps of risk for the glory of God that God has impressed upon their hearts to do an outreach initiative where every single household in Bridgeport will have access to the gospel of John and to be able to hear the good news of Jesus. Let me just say it one more time. We want to see every household in Bridgeport. We're talking thousands upon thousands of people hearing the good news of Christ. 
You know, personally, I'm excited for this because it brings us back to the very reason why Bridgeport is here and why our family, the Lamb family, is committed to Park Community Church here. It's because we want to see the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed to all people until there is no place left to see all the people in Bridgeport hear the gospel of Jesus. Amen? Amen. With that, I'd like to invite up Grant and Julie to share more about this outreach initiative. Let's give them a hand. Thank you, Kenson. Uh, as Kenson mentioned, so my wife Julie and I, along with a number of others now, have been uh, inspired and gripped by the mission of our church, which is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus to all people until there's no place left. And as Kenson mentioned, our church is particularly focused on the neighborhood of Bridgeport. And if you look at Bridgeport, all, all people and no place left is actually very concrete. We know how many people are in Bridgeport. You know how many, you can like, it's hilariously easy actually. You can get the addresses and names of all of the people in Bridgeport, which is why you probably get so much marketing mail. It's like really easy. And that has been sort of interesting and inspiring to us because we thought about, okay, what would it look like to try and present the gospel in a winsome way to literally everyone in the neighborhood. And you could knock on everyone's doors, and that would take like six months, so, and people wouldn't be home, so that's not a great idea. But what we've come up with is, what would it look like to send everyone in Bridgeport a package? Anyone who gets a package opens it. You're like, what was this? Did I order something? Did someone get me a gift? And then what would you put in the package? And we considered a number of things and ultimately landed on, you have to, it has to be something with the Word of God. The Word of God is living and active. And we thought, let's do the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is often used in outreach, as this <laughs> beautiful example illustrates, uh, both my wife and the book. And um, the idea is that we would send everyone in the whole neighborhood one of these, and that inside that would, there would be an insert. And the insert would say three things. and say, Kevin. I'm just looking at Kevin. Uh, Kevin. My name is Grant. I go to this church called Park Community Church Bridgeport. I've actually been praying for you for the past month. Quick explanation of the gospel message, sharing that there's more detail in this book. That's a book of the Bible called the Gospel of John. And then if you'd like, we'd love to have you come to our Easter service that Park is having shortly. And interestingly, Easter, this, this was not planned, but the Easter message this year will be the Easter story from the Gospel of John, which is just kind of wild. Um, and I will now turn it over to Julia to share a little bit more about how this will look practically. Awesome. So our vision for this outreach is that it would be very personalized and very covered in prayer. And that's where we would really love um, all of you to come in and partner with us in this effort. So we are looking for volunteers to do three things. Um, one, we're at... Um, Basically, there's one volunteer role in which um, you would be praying for each of the different uh, members of various households of Bridgeport. So essentially, if you sign up to volunteer, we would give you a list of 300 names of different people in Bridgeport. And um, the cool thing here is that if we get 35 volunteers to pray for 300 households, then we would be praying for every single person in the neighborhood of Bridgeport by name, which I think is really exciting. Um, the second thing you would do if you sign up to volunteer is you would then come to an assembly day on March 9th, the morning of March 9th, to then assemble packages of the Gospel of John and the little card that Grant mentioned um, to send to the specific 300 households that you have been praying for. And then finally, you would also be kind of like a point of contact for if they had any questions, um, your name and contact information would be on the little insert card for those 300 people that you've been praying for. So just to break this down um, in some little chat GBT cartoons, uh, just to show what we see this looking like, um, if you do choose to sign up, again, you would get a list of 300 households in Bridgeport to be praying for. Then you would join us um, for assembly day in early March and assemble the packages for those 300 households. Uh, we'd have it all ready to go, so it would actually be super quick, just kind of inserting the Gospel of John into a package, and then we'll get them mailed off. 
And then our vision is that this would reach individuals who um, are seeking to get to know God more and that the package would make them curious and want to learn more um, about Jesus. So maybe an individual would be having some um, challenges in their family or something that they want prayer for, and this package would meet them at the right time. Um, and so they may be interested in learning more about um, Jesus and about Park and may reach out to you um, with interest in more prayer um, or attending one of our services. So that's our um, vision for this. We would love to chat more if you have any questions. Uh, we will be at the Connect Bar in the back after this. And then there's also a QR code uh, if you'd like to sign up to volunteer. Again, the volunteer ask is just that you're praying for individuals within Bridgeport and that you join us for the March 9th Assembly Day. So, My um, funny, funny story is we've been thinking about this. My grandparents came to faith through an outreach not dissimilar from this. And it reminds me of the parable of the sower in that we will be sort of planting seeds and some will fall on rocky soil and nothing will happen and our prayer is that some will fall on good soil. And our invitation to you is to imagine what it could look like if a year from now you are at the lakefront at the park baptism celebration and someone is sharing their testimony and their testimony involves you having mailed them the Gospel of John in this way and like how cool that would be. And our other thought with all of this is that there may be people that you mail this to who you never know what happens. And that the first time you learn about it of having an impact at all is when after you've died, you're entering the new heavens and the new earth. And as you like walk through the gates or whatever that looks like, someone runs out and says, did you mail a copy of the Gospel of John in 2024? And you're like, I think so. And they're like, that, that, change the trajectory of my life. And that is our invitation. That is our hope. We would love for you to participate, if you are able, on Saturday, March 9th. Thank you so much. Okay, now we'll enter into a time of offering. On the screen here, you'll see that there's four different ways to give. And then the Connections team will be coming up to pass the, um, to pass the offering bag. Let us pray, or pray with me now. Heavenly Father, um, we just thank you so much for the inspiration that you've given to Grant and Julia uh, to be able to get this program started, Lord, um, that you've given them this thought and um, opportunity, Lord, to be able to reach so many people in our community. Um, Lord, I just pray for the people that will be receiving this Gospel of John booklet um, let the message that we write in that um, mailer be clear to them. Um, let them, if they have questions or curiosity, give them the boldness to come, Lord, to service on Easter Sunday. And we pray um, that that mailer would be a blessing to people who may be in a dark place, Lord, um, that it would give them some hope and some clarity and an opportunity to connect with you, Lord. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Will you turn or open your Bibles to Luke 6? So we're in Luke 6, verses 1 through 11. And read with me. Again, that's Luke 6, 1 through 11. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those with him. And he said to them, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. Verse 6. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered, and the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, come and stand here. And he rose and he stood there, and Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? 
to save life or to destroy it. And after looking around them, all he said to them, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Friends, today we continue back on our church-wide sermon series in the Gospel of Luke that we started in September. And at the same time, we are wrapping up our January sermon series on flourish. Uh, Once again, this idea of flourish for us as a church is to reject this idea of spiritual complacency and taking steps to live a life with God that is deep, dynamic, and transforming. You know, I would encourage you to listen to our sermons back in September and also for the last two sermons <clears throat> just uh, in the month of uh, January here, as we talked about different topics around the idea of spiritual flourishing and what the spiritual growth cycle looks like. And for today, we're going to talk about flourishing by honoring the Sabbath. And I do want to give thanks to J.R. Baster, a pastor in Texas who gave a wonderful sermon to, give, to help give a lot of shape to this sermon. And also to remind you that we will be receiving communion at the very end of our sermon here. So please, anytime from now to the end of the sermon, make sure you grab a communion packet as you'll be receiving communion together as a family. Burnout and stress is everywhere. You know, there's increased demands at home. Many of us are working longer hours, more hours, more jobs. You know, recent surveys reported that 32% of workers reported emotional exhaustion, 44% noted high levels of physical fatigue, and living in Chicago only amplifies those issues. Chicago has the nickname as the city of broad shoulders or big shoulders. This came from a poem back in 1914, celebrating the hardworking nature of Chicago citizens and being the industrial powerhouse of the world. This was true in 1914 and true today in 2024. We are working ourselves to sheer exhaustion. Anytime you ask someone, how are you, it's typically one of two responses. One is, oh, I'm just so busy. I have so much work to do. And the other one is, oh, I really need a vacation. I need a vacation. Our city is filled with people who need rest. We're tired. We're exhausted. We're depleted. We're always running from one thing to the next thing. And when we do take a break, all we're doing is thinking about the things that should be getting done that's not getting done. Our minds are constantly turning. We live at breakneck speeds. We all, we, we're always pushing ourselves to the limits and denying ourselves of the most basic necessity like sleep. That we're continually propping ourselves up with caffeine. That we have these things called these five-hour energy drinks. That we have become so poor at managing our time and energy that we have companies that are making millions of dollars off our need for an energy boost. We are a people so exhausted. You know, Mark Buchanan said this in his book, The Rest of God. And let me just show it to you on the screen here. He says this. God is complete without rest, but not us. For us, rest is indispensable. Indeed, all things made by God need rest, and maybe especially us. Because unlike goats and beetles and flies and lizards, we try to outwit and outrun our limits. We think we're the exception, the ones for whom busyness will translate into fruitfulness. We think because we figured out ways to build impossibly tall buildings and dig immensely deep broad holes, to spy on babies in the womb, to tease out strands of DNA, to send whole computer files from New York to Nairobi in a split second. We think because our industry and ingenuity seem boundless, we can also figure a way around God-imposed need for stillness. We can't. The need is not conjured away by medication, technology, discipline, cleverness, sheer willfulness. It always comes back to take its due. We cannot outrun the God-imposed limits that he has placed in each of our lives. To do so will only bring harm to our lives and to those around us. We are not invincible. 
We must acknowledge that we are not God. We do not sustain all things. Instead, we need to be sustained and we need to be healed. We need rest. And God in his grace has provided us rest. God created this day called Sabbath so that rest would be woven into the rhythm of our lives. You know, Sabbath rest is, God's, is part of God's top ten commandments. You know, think about that. God says that this is what I want for you. Don't worship idols, don't kill people, don't commit adultery, and take a nap. That, that is wonderful. God puts the Sabbath on his top ten because we need it to flourish. Uh, let me show you Exodus 20 and where this idea of the commandment of the Sabbath comes in. So Exodus 20 on the screen here says this. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Notice that it says, God made Sabbath holy. He consecrated it. He set it apart and made a unique day separated from all other days to rest. No work was to be done within this 24-hour period. And to principalize this, when we Sabbath, we cease from what we would call duty. Now, I'm not talking about things like feeding your kids. You don't take a break from those things. You have to do those things. But duty things mean this. Our, our jobs, our wage-earning work, our long list of to-dos and chores that just wipe us out mentally, emotionally, and physically. Sabbath is a time to engage in what brings delight and breathes life into us. A time where no work is done and a time of worship, a time set apart for God. Exodus 20 says that God has blessed the Sabbath, which means that if you want to experience blessing, if you want to experience flourishing, you must befriend the Sabbath. The closer you are to the Sabbath, the closer you are to God's blessing that is promised in Exodus 20. Now, in our passage here, we actually see the opposite happening. Practicing Sabbath was no longer a blessing to the people, but a burden. And the reason for this is because when God gave the commandment to not work on the Sabbath, the word work was never defined clearly. So the Mishnah, which is a rabbinical commentary, rabbinical commentary on Hebrew scriptures, laid out 29 classes of the type of work that would be unlawful on the Sabbath. So, for example, it would say these things in the commentary. You know, normal wage-earning work it was prohibited. That makes sense. But it also said you couldn't sew more than one stitch. You couldn't write more than one alphabetical letter because if you put two letters together, you might create a word. And any creation type of activity was forbidden on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, you could save someone's life if it was in jeopardy, but if it was something mild like a dislocated foot or hand, you couldn't set it back to the next day. So that stunk, okay? If someone died on the Sabbath, you had to leave the body there until the following day. So you had all these rabbinical teachings and may, which made the Sabbath very rigid and it became a very heavy load on the back of people. So instead of the Sabbath being a blessing, it became a yoke, a ty tyranny. You know, it was rule after rule after rule after rule. And we see, in this, we see in our story that Jesus and his disciples are walking through a grain field and they're hungry and they pick, field, they pick heads of grain and eat them. And when they start doing this, you know, we have to realize that the Pharisees see this and they're like, ha, you broke the law. Now let me first say this. For the disciples and Jesus to eat the grain heads, that was not unlawful. To do it in someone's field was not unlawful. In fact, it was God's very provision in the law of Moses in Deuteronomy 23 for farmers not to harvest everything from their fields. 
that they're to leave some grapes on the field, to leave some grain on the fields, to leave a little bit of fruit on the trees, to provide for those who are hungry and poor. This was a law of mercy that God provided to care for the people. If you remember the story of Ruth, this is exactly that rule at play. So the problem here is not that Jesus and his disciples are eating heads of grain from the field. What was wrong was when they were doing it. They were doing it on the Sabbath day. So the disciples eat the grain. The Pharisees and religious leaders jump out and say, gotcha, you broke the law. Verse 1 and 2. On a Sabbath, while they were going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? For the Pharisees, the religious leaders, Jesus and his disciples broke at least four laws. First, by picking the grains, they were guilty of reaping on the Sabbath. Second, by separating the grain from the stalk, they were guilty of threshing. Thirdly, by rubbing the grain in their hands and separating the grain from the chaff and then blowing the chaff away, they were guilty of winnowing on the Sabbath. And by eating it now, they were guilty of food preparation. This is crazy. Per their Jewish tradition, they broke law after law after law after law. And this was a big deal because a violation like this was life or death to work on the Sabbath. So Jesus knows this and he schools them. He says that, you know what, I might have broken your laws, but I did not break God's law. You know, Jesus points, proves this point by taking them to a story in the Old Testament. Uh, verse 3 and 4. And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread from the, of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. This story is from 1 Samuel chapter 21 in reference when David and his men were running from King Saul and they run into the tabernacle and these men were hungry. So they go to the priest Ahimelech and ask for food and the only food that they had in the temple at that time was the showbread. The showbread were the 12 loaves of bread that sat in the tabernacle representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And the priest once a week would change the old bread with the new bread, and the priest and only the priest were allowed to eat the old bread. David was not a priest. His men were not priests. It would be unlawful for him to eat it, but the priest gave the show bread, gave this holy bread to David and his men to care for them. So Jesus looks at the Pharisees and says, do you remember this story? Do you remember reading the story? Of course they did. Your king, King David, did something unlawful and ate the showbread, and the priest was cool with it, and God didn't strike them dead. So why in the world are you giving me so much grief about eating this grain? Now, now here's a quick question. Why did God overlook the breaking of the rule of, of, the, of the holy bread, the showbread? Because only the priest could eat this in the holy place. It's because there is a greater principle at play. Compassion is more important than religious ritual. We see this greater principle of love and mercy throughout Scripture. Let me show you a few verses here. Hosea 6.6. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. Isaiah 58 says this. Behold, in the day of your fast... You seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast, the the people of God here, the nation of Israel. You fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice be heard on high. Is it not this the fast that I chose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? God tells the nation of Israel, I don't care about your fasting. Why? Because you have no care for your fellow man. 
Compassion is greater than religious ritual. And just one more verse here, Psalm 51. The sacrifices of God are a broken heart, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. This was a prayer of repentance that David made after his adultery of Bathsheba and killing her husband. David knew the sacrifice God was looking for was not that of a blood of a lamb or goats. God was looking for a broken heart. Compassion is more important than religious ritual. So Jesus continues by saying in verse 5, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The Son of Man is the divine title given to Jesus. In essence, Jesus is saying, I'm the creator of the Sabbath. I'm the one who gave the command and blessed it. And if I'm the Lord of the Sabbath and I'm not offended by the fact that my disciples are eating grain, you should not be offended for me. Okay, I got this. Don't you worry about this. Now in verses 6 and 11, Luke gives us the next story on another Sabbath day. You see how the stories are connecting here? All around the Sabbath day. Now in this story, the Pharisees once again, they are waiting to see if Jesus is going to break another one of their violations by healing a man with a withered hand. Now this probably meant that this hand was paralyzed or experienced some, some incredible trauma to it. The Pharisees believed that healing was a form of work and therefore unlawful during the Sabbath. So Jesus knows that he's being tested again. So he says, verse 9 to 11, And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful in the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or destroy it? And after looking around at them, all he said to them, said to him, stretch out your hand, and he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Jesus knew in their hearts that they cared nothing about doing good. All they cared about was keeping the rules. They didn't care about being generous or compassionate or being kind. These religious leaders were so blinded by the hardness of their heart. And here's the irony of our story here. It's wrong in their minds to heal on the Sabbath but it's okay to plot murderous thoughts against Jesus. The Pharisees completely miss it. Instead of the Sabbath being a blessing, a means of flourishing, it became a form of tyranny. In the Gospel of Mark, it records the same event, and Jesus says this. Let me show it to you. Mark chapter 2 here. And Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is not some sort of master that we must submit and give reports to. We are not made to serve the Sabbath. The Sabbath was given to serve us. The Sabbath is not to be a burden, but to be a blessing to the people, a means of flourishing. So in light of this passage, let's ask this question. How can the Sabbath help us to spiritually flourish. Here's the first point. Sabbath points us to God and his work. Sabbath points us to God and his work. Now, the core issue of our stories is legalism. That's what's happening here. What has happened is that the religious leaders have turned the Sabbath from being about God to being about them and the pursuit of their works righteousness. The Sabbath has become about what they can achieve, what they can earn, what they, how they can make themselves acceptable before God. This is the complete opposite of the Sabbath. It's not about trusting in your works. It's trusting in God and His works. One of the reasons it's so hard for us to Sabbath is because we wrap our identity up so much in what we do, in what we can accomplish, in how we can perform, in how we are perceived by other people. And this is suffocating. Friends, we can live one of two ways. Identity achieved or identity received. Identity achieved means that it's through my efforts, my righteousness, my own works, my own accomplishments, then I am a somebody. That is a form of bondage. Because if you do well, 
you're going to feel great. But if you don't, then you end up in shame and loathing yourself. The reason so many of us are constantly doing is because that's the measure of our being. We find security and significance by the works of our own hands. So we got to do more. We have to be more. We got to accomplish more. We got to make more money. The Sabbath is a rebellion against that. Sabbath proclaims that you will not be defined by the works of your hands. You will be defined by the works of God's hands. I will not be defined by my accomplishments. I will be defined by what Christ has accomplished. To practice true Sabbath is to receive an identity from God through faith in Jesus Christ. In Christ we are forgiven and adopted into the family of God. We are recipients of the Holy Spirit, a son and daughter of God, a member of his church. We have a future home in the new heavens and the new earth. Sabbath is a way for us to rest from working, from earning, because our value, our significance, our worth, our meaning, our identity, our joy is not rooted in what we can accomplish, but what Christ has done to save us and to love us. You know, when you read the Genesis account, you notice that Adam was created on the sixth day, and then on the seventh day was the day of rest. Think about that. Adam is created on the sixth day, and immediately he enters into God's rest. And then coming out of the Sabbath, he begins to do the works that God gave him to do, which was to have dominion, dominion and to cultivate the ground around him. Adam begins his existence resting in being in God's workmanship and being loved by God. And it's from that rest he begins his work. That is the rhythm of Scripture. It's not that you would work yourself to death and then enter rest, but that you would rest, and in that resting and being loved and being known by God, then you engage in what he has called you to do. You are not working for his acceptance. You're working from his acceptance. The Sabbath is a day to recognize that God didn't create us to accomplish tasks, but to be in love with him. This is our purpose we weren't created for a job. We weren't created for our ability to produce. We were created first and foremost for God. On the Sabbath, we are to enjoy God and his gifts. It's, to, it's, it's one day to be rather than to do. Friends, when we practice Sabbath, we practice a countercultural type of trust. We don't rest because everything is done. We rest because God has promised that when we do rest, he'll take care of everything else. That's why we rest. Here's the second reason Sabbath can lead to flourishing. It points us to our ultimate hope. It points us to our ultimate hope. You know, in the second story of our passage, Jesus heals the man with a withered hand and something that I notice in the gospel is that Jesus does a lot of healing on the Sabbath. And let me just show you here all the recorded moments of Jesus healing on the Sabbath. That Jesus heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law, the man with the withered hand, our story today. He heals a man born blind. He heals a crippled woman. He heals a man with dropsy. He drives an evil spirit out. He heals a lame man by the pool of Bethsaida. We see Jesus here healing on the Sabbath because... It points to a coming Sabbath where God is going to restore all things. Lame legs will dance. Everything withered will come back to life. The blind will see. The mute will sing. The Sabbath tells us that there is coming an ultimate rest where everything broken and falling is going to be healed and raised up. What we see here in Luke chapter 6 is just a foretaste of this day. When we choose the Sabbath, we are rehearsing this ultimate hope. We're rehearsing for this coming day. 
And it's when we do this, we fill our heart with hope because it reminds us of God's story. It reminds us of God's glorious future, that Jesus will return one day again to bring an ultimate Sabbath, to bring an ultimate rest. He will bring a new creation where creation is fully healed, where all sickness and sin and injustice and poverty and suffering and death are all banished for all eternity in a new heaven and the new earth. This is what's exactly meant in Hebrews 4.9 when the author says this. Let me show you the verse. Hebrews 4.9 says, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. There is a coming day when there will be an ultimate rest for the people of God. So we Sabbath. We Sabbath, even in the midst of a broken world, to rehearse and to remind ourselves that there is a day coming when God is going to heal all that is wounded. He's going to raise up all that are fallen, and he will restore all that's been broken. So we rest to remind ourselves of that hope. But here's the thing. This hope is more than just waiting for a day to come. But it's also a reminder that God wants to bring more and more of that ultimate rest into our lives today. That as we wait for the fullness of this coming rest, God wants healing and renewal today. He wants to bring renewal into our relationships. He wants to bring justice to the oppressed. He wants to bring food to the hungry. He wants healing for their hurting. He wants us to be a Sabbath people who not only rest well, but Sabbath people who bring rest and flourishing into our cities. We are to be a Sabbath people who live with a Sabbath hope to say one day there's coming an ultimate rest and we want to be a people to bring to our city a foretaste of the coming Sabbath. So we care for the more marginalized. We care for the poor. We fight against oppression and cruelty and injustice. We help the sick and hungry. We are a Sabbath people and we want to bring Sabbath rest into our world and our city. So with that, how do we practically practice the Sabbath? What does that look like? Now, first it's important to know that in Christ, the Sabbath now is more than just a 24-window hour of time. In Christ and in the New Covenant, the Sabbath has found its fulfillment. Now, this doesn't mean that we ignore the fourth commandment. We do not ignore the fourth commandment. But we have to understand that Jesus now ushers us into a deeper kind of rest than the literal Sabbath could ever offer. Let me show you Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The rest offered on the Sabbath is now being offered in Christ. Also in Colossians chapter 2, it says this. Let me show it to you. Colossians 2 says, Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to to Christ. What the Apostle Paul does here is that he puts the Sabbath day together with food laws and Jewish festivals, and he says that all of them are but a shadow of the coming of Christ, and that now that Christ has come, the literal 24 hours of Sabbath is no longer a matter of obedience or disobedience, it's a matter of conscience. The Sabbath that God is looking for is much deeper than a day. Think about this. Just because you have a Sabbath day does not mean you have a Sabbath heart. Let me say that one more time. You can tweet this, okay? You can go on X and tweet this, whatever. Just because you have a Sabbath day does not mean you have a Sabbath heart. Without faith, our rest will be restless, Christ lived, died, resurrected to give you so much more than just a day of rest. He died and resurrected to give you a heart 
of rest now and for all eternity. So this is the point I'm making. We don't need to be legalistic about the 24-hour Sabbath. Entering rest isn't mainly about putting hours aside away from work. Rest is believing in what Christ has done for you. And many of you, that will be on Sundays. 90% of you, that will be on Sundays. For me, I work on Sundays. So Sabbath is not, Sundays are not my Sabbath day. And that's okay in God's economy. Because rest, once again, is believing in what Christ has done. And what the Old Testament has always pointed to. But let me say this. Even though we are not bound to the literal 24-hour day of Sabbath, I believe that it is very, very wise to still practice it. I will go as far as to say that if you choose not to practice Sabbath, you better have a really good reason why you're not doing that. I believe, I believe that we should practice this because, first off, God rested on the seventh day. And if it was good enough for God, it's good enough for us. And I believe that taking one day in a week to be restful is good for our health. It's good for us in a day when we can work anytime and anywhere to say, I worked yesterday, I'll work tomorrow, but today I will rest and worship. So what then are we to do on this day, on this Sabbath day when we choose to have it? It's Ex Exodus 20 says this again. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the Sabbath day is a but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. The seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. It's a day to God. It's tenaciously directed toward God. It's on the Sabbath day we give our attention to the Lord in a more focused and sustained way than all the other six days of the week. The Sabbath is an invitation from God where we give the best of our hearts and the best of our minds to God. We intentionally pause and create space to meet with God. And let me just say, intentionality is so important because for many of us, and myself included, it's very easy to give no thought to the Lord's day. We can be careless and not thoughtful about what we're doing. And I don't say this to guilt us, but to convict us to be more intentional. It's important to plan and prepare for this day. And let me just say, the Jewish community does a fantastic job with this in preparing for the Sabbath. That for the Jewish people, they get their meals ready the day beforehand. So on the Sabbath, they're not cooking and cleaning. They're knocking out chores and all their duties so that the Sabbath is protected. In the same way, we need to plan so we're not going to be distracted with all our duties and responsibilities that's constantly knocking on our lives. So, so what are you, so you going to do with your Sabbath? You know, are you going to read a book, take a walk, go to a museum, go to a coffee shop and enjoy the company of others, go play with the kids, take a long nap. Maybe you put the phone away and turn off all entertainment. And of course, on the Sabbath, you come to church and you worship with the body of Christ. Some of us are going way too fast to experience the Sabbath. You need to plan to slow down. The Sabbath encourages us to embrace the quiet because quietness nurtures stillness and stillness increases our capacity to hear and experience God. Some of you might say, well, I don't feel like I really know that, you know, really know when God is speaking to me. I, I don't really know if I can sense God's voice in my life. I, I don't really know if I'm experiencing God in a real way. This might be happening because your capacity to listen and experience God is shrinking because you are not embracing the Sabbath. There are rooms in the heart, it, there are rooms that God has never had a chance to walk into, into your life. Because they can only be opened up during times of stillness and times of rest. So when we observe the Sabbath and take those intentional and extended hours of rest, take that time to pray. Spend time in communication with the Lord. Think about the Lord. Read the scriptures. Read a devotional book. Take a contemplative walk where, where you just interact with the Lord. Sit in silence and solitude. 
The Sabbath day is a day God breathes life into you through his word and through prayer and all the wonderful things around you like recreation and relationships. Friends, we flourish through the Sabbath, Sabbath because it reminds us that we are not God. So we lay down our work and trust him. May we be a Sabbath people for the flourishing of our lives, for the glory of God, and for the joy of our city. Amen? Amen. Friends, with that, I'd like to invite all of you to take out your communion packet. Communion is an opportunity to bring us back to the night before Jesus is crucified and how he has one final Passover meal with his disciples to remind them and to point to them of the work that is coming on the cross, of how his body will be broken and how his blood would be shed. And the way that it connects to our sermon today is that it's at the cross, all our working comes to an end. All our working to prove ourselves acceptable to God, all our working to try to be more, to have more, we can let it all go because it's in Christ. We have everything, and it's in Christ he has done everything. That today, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, God looks to us as he looks to Christ, as his beloved son and daughter. And we can rest in that. Now, for some of you here today, you are not a follower of Jesus Christ. You do not profess him as your Lord and Savior. The first thing that I would say is to not receive communion because to do so would be to do it in a way that Jesus did not intend for communion to be received. But I also want to say this, is that if today the Holy Spirit has gripped your heart, that the burden that you feel, the tyranny of just trying to be someone, trying to live up to people's opinions and standards in your life, to keep up the image, that the Spirit is now calling you to let that all go, let me just tell you that the Spirit is calling you to put your faith in Jesus Christ, to make him your Lord and Savior, to confess and to ask for forgiveness of your sins, to know that you've been living a life that has been contrary to what God has intended for your life, and to call him Lord and to ask him to lead every step of the way from here on out. There's a prayer on the screen here. Nothing fancy or magical about these words, just an opportunity for you to articulate in your heart what the Spirit might be doing. And let me just say that if you are making this prayer in your heart right now, if you feel the Spirit of God moving you to confession of who Christ is, the first thing is this, I want you to talk to me and any of the deacons that we have to decide. Talk to the friend who brought you here today. We want to celebrate with you and journey with you in your walk with Christ. And the second thing is this, we want you to go ahead and receive communion because you are part of the family of God. So with that, let's go ahead and bow our heads and let's pray. Father God, we thank you that it is the gospel of Christ that reminds us that rest has been achieved. That God, for all of the Old Testament, it only proved that we could never, ever do enough to satisfy your holiness, to be able to pay off the debt of our sin. Impossible. That God, that in some ways we were in a constant perpetual state of restlessness. But God, it's in Jesus Christ that he's the one who can say, cast your burdens upon me and I will give you rest because it's on the cross he took all of our burdens. God, help us to not be so stubborn and to be so prideful as not to trust our Lord and Savior Christ and to give up these things to him. Father God, I pray, Lord, that not only would you help us to practice the discipline of a Sabbath day, but more importantly, Father, would you give us a Sabbath heart to rest and to believe in what Christ did for us on the cross. And for us, Lord, if any of our friends here today are professing that for the very first time, that God, it's when they're resting in you, God, help them to know that it's in that moment when they rest and they give everything up to you, they are saved. God, would you do that wonderful work? God, would you help us to be a Sabbath people, to experience Sabbath rest, and to bring that rest in our city? 
It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So friends, I just want to invite you to take a few moments wherever you're sitting at to confess and to pray and to talk to God. And as you're ready, receive communion um, as you're ready. And the worship team will lead us in some songs. In your own time, as you are ready, please stand and join with us as we respond in worship. Sing, tis so sweet. So sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise and to know the saith the Lord. Oh, oh, oh. Jesus, 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 how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Jesus, Jesus. 
side of the stage, so I'd welcome you to go over and, and pray with them. Now look to me and receive this benediction. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Go in peace, your loved. Thank you.